Welcome back to the Darbar Hall at the 14th Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Ditol. It is our pleasure to present today The Good Girls, Sonia Falero in conversation with Saman Subramaniam. Sonia Falero has a vivid journalistic eye for details and a storyteller's gift for delivering a riveting tale. In her latest book, The Good Girls, An Ordinary Killing, attention turns to a macabre episode in Uttar Pradesh when the dead bodies of two young girls are discovered suspended from a tree. Based on a real-life incident in 2014 that brought up questions about female friendship, honor killing and the rule of law, Falero's novel enters the psychological ambit of personal choice and the community's interpretation of sex, love and romance. Sonia, an award-winning writer of three previous books, including Beautiful Thing, will speak about the research and challenges of creating her new book. In conversation with distinguished writer and journalist Saman Subramaniam, whose work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine and other publications. Sonia Falero is the author of The Good Girls, An Ordinary Killing and Beautiful Thing, Inside the Secret World of Bombay's Dance Bar. She's founder of the literary mentorship program South Asia Speaks and the co-founder of DECA, a global cooperative of award-winning journalists. Saman Subramaniam is an award-winning journalist. His most recent book, A Dominant Character, is a biography of the scientist and communist J.B.S. Haldane. His first book, Following Fish, Travels Around the Indian Coast, won the Shakti Bhatt First Book Prize. His second book, This Divided Island, Stories from the Sri Lankan War, won the 2015 Crossword Prize for Nonfiction. Please do remember to comment and ask questions by typing it in the comment section. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present the good girls, Sonia Falero, in conversation with Samant Subramaniam. Over to you, Samant. Um, it's such a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I have uh, known and admired Sonia for a long time from afar. Uh, in the early 2000s, there were a bunch of us in India who were starting to uh, get interested in literary nonfiction. But Sonia was first of the blocks with a uh, beautiful thing, which set the tone for so many books to follow. Uh, and subsequently, I've gotten to know her um, much better and I've become a friend. And it's a uh, it's a real sort of uh, honor to talk about um, the good girls. Uh, it, the, the adjective readable uh, to the lay audience sometimes might sound like faint praise. It sounds like edible. You can just about read it. You can just about eat it. Um, but to writers, it has something very specific. Uh, it has a specific meaning, which is that it keeps you turning the page. You will never stop turning the pages of the good girls because uh, it is just compulsively readable. Um, and it is a, it is an art. It is an art to make to write a book like that. And Sonia is a past master at it. So Sonia, Sonia, thank you so much um, for permitting me uh, to ask you badgering questions about uh, the book and its process. Um, for those of you who don't who don't know uh, the book as well, I thought what we would do is start with a little reading from the opening section of the book, Sonia, uh, which lays yes. out both the the two characters that we will come to know uh, through the rest of the book, but also the context in which they live. Uh, so uh, if we could start with that, and then I, I will plunge right in with questions. Okay, Okay. firstly, Salman, thank you so much um, for doing this. I really appreciate your time. We joked about the fact that we are not only in the same city in London, but we like a couple of blocks from each other. <laughs> but uh, here we are. So thank you to you and thank you to Teamwork and JLF and everybody who's watching. Um, the chapter that I'm going to read is, um, it's, it's actually the first chapter, An Accusation is Made. Here we go. Rajiv Kumar had a side job as a government teacher, but his real job was farming. While working his land, he had observed Padma and Lali. They were as alike as two grains of rice, and they spent all day in the fields. Now one girl, he couldn't tell which, had a phone to her ear. He didn't like it. 
Some villages in Uttar Pradesh forbade unmarried women from using phones. A phone was a key to a door that led outside the village via calls and messaging apps. The villagers were afraid of what would happen if women stepped through this door. They might get ideas about whom to marry. Records show that 95% of Indians still married within their caste, and anyone who didn't attracted attention. In 2013, a young woman from Katra village took off with a man from a different caste. Her father was so ashamed, he couldn't show his face, people said. The woman had chosen to marry against her, his will, to have what was known as a love marriage, rather than leaving it to her father to arrange a partner for her. She had violated the honor code and would never see her parents again for their safety and certainly hers. A few months after that, it was the turn of a girl from the next door hamlet of Jati. The news of the elopements moved like a swarm of whirring insects, landing first here and then there, until all the nearby villages were warned. Change is coming. Be vigilant. Be ready to act. In 2014, for the first time, the National Crime Records Bureau, which publishes a number of cases registered for crimes, published data on honor killings. 28 cases were reported in the country, but everyone knew the true number was hundreds, if not thousands more. Girls were killed for marrying outside their caste or outside their religion, and sometimes having premarital sex was reason enough. With the killing, the family's honor was reclaimed, or at least the other villagers were given notice that the family had taken the errant behavior seriously and done their best to right a wrong. The constitution had existed for only decades, while Hindu religious beliefs dated back thousands of years, said one father who was accused of killing his daughter. In Katra, the rule was that boys could own phones, but girls had to get permission to use them. Even so, Badma and Lali knew what to do with the phone better than their mothers, who could identify neither letters nor numbers. Badma often called her maternal uncles, reciprocating the effort they had put into keeping in touch after their only sister, Badma's biological mother, had died. Lali texted her elder brother, who worked for a car parts manufacturer far away. The girls used the torch feature to light their way into the pit of the night. Rajiv Kumar didn't know this because he didn't know them. He didn't even know their parents beyond the usual subtik. But a girl's life was everyone's business. He was determined to do his duty. His plot was near some land owned by a close relative of the girls named Babu Nazruram. With his bowl cut, barn-stained teeth and sloppy smile, Nazru was approachable. At 26, he wasn't that much older than the girls. They shouldn't be out in public with a mobile phone, Rajiv Kumar said, speaking in Braj Pasha, the language of these parts. Who knows who they are talking to? Although the fields adjoined the village, the walking distance from the Shakya house to the orchard was 10 minutes or more. The orchard wasn't even visible from the house, which was located in a spider web of lanes. Rajiv Kumar's implication was clear. The girls chose that particular time because they were alone. They chose that place because it was secluded. To remove any doubt, he used the word chakkar to indicate there was something crooked about all this, something off balance. The girls in your family are romancing someone, he said. Nazru agreed that it didn't look good. You should let their parents know, Rajiv Kumar said. A few days passed and Rajiv Kumar again saw the girls talking on the phone. He again sought out Nazru, who explained that a complaint could backfire. The girls' parents might accuse him of slander. Rumors were butterflies, they might say. If word got around, who would marry Padma? Who would have Lali? Nasru understood that it was one thing for Rajiv Kumar to talk. It was another for a relative, a first cousin no less, to level an accusation of such grave seriousness. And there was the other matter to consider, which was that he depended on the family. Everyone in the village struggled, but he had an asthmatic father to care for and a brother people called crazy. The Shakya sometimes hired him to work their land. If things got truly difficult, they could be counted on to come through with cash. So Nasru said nothing, but mindful of his duty, he started to watch the girls. His behavior didn't go unnoticed. He ogles us, Padma said to a friend with disgust. It was while Nasru was keeping warm, he came across the spindly bobblehead boy. Katra village was small and Nasru knew everyone who lived there. 
but he didn't know this boy. The boy was grazing his buffalo, so he couldn't have come from far. It was natural to assume that he was a Yadav from the hamlet next door. What's your name? Nazru shouted. Papu. The young man's name, in fact, was Darvesh Yadav. He was sharp-nosed, with a shock of very black hair. People called him Papu because he was small, like a boy. Papu wore an oversized shirt and trousers, a hoop in his ear, and rubber slippers on his feet. Although his face was imprinted with apprehension, Papu's life was more secure than most in the hamlet of Jati. His father was a watermelon farmer who had accumulated enough savings to build one of the few brick houses in a settlement of shacks. Papu's mother doted on him, her youngest child. Although his parents' lives revolved around the sandy riverbank home of their crop, their children from finding work elsewhere during the off-season, picking through garbage for recyclables or hefting brick construction sites, even as far away as Delhi. And because of this, Papu had seen a world outside the one his parents were rooted to, a world in which roads were crammed with cars and not farm animals where there were soaring buildings and ambitious men and women doing more than just the one thing in the one way it had always been done. A modern India, where the burdens and entrapments that had kept generations of his family collecting cow dung could be swept away and forgotten. And although Papu didn't know anyone who had left the village for good, this new world was full of promise. Freedom was close. But Papu, although he was nearly 20, could only write his name and he was expected to help support his family. They had a deal, father and son. As long as Papu contributed financially, he could do as he pleased in his free time. Nazru wasn't having it. If your animals eat all my grass, he shouted, what will my animals eat? Don't you come here again. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, that was fantastic. I mean, it gives readers uh, and listeners uh, a sense of who the book is going to be about, but more importantly, it gives them a sense of just the granularity of detail and the perfect texture of these pages. Uh, and this is what you can expect through the rest of the book if you read The Good Girls, is just the unfolding of a story. Um, I want to ask you, and to anyone who was living in India in 2014, they will remember the Katra Sadat Ganj deaths of these two girls. Uh, but it is, of course, a, 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 a sorry truth that uh, there are several cases like this in India. Yeah. Uh, one emerged a couple of days ago, uh, eerily identical to uh, the contours of the good girls. And so I, was, I, I wanted to ask you, why, why this case? Why these two girls? What uh, prompted you to uh, examine this particular incident in such depth? I saw, I think like, like most of us, uh, a picture of the children. Uh, it was circulating on Twitter. And uh, the picture showed the girls who uh, I, I call Padma and Lali because of course I can't use their real names, hanging uh, by their necks in a tree. And uh, a group of women who I later learned were, you know, Padma's stepmother, Lali's mother, their grandmother, um, and, and various friends and family members just sitting, looking up at them as though in, in absolute, you know, disbelief, uh, of course, I, at what they were seeing. Um, everybody said uh, on, on Twitter and then later on in the, in the media that the children had gone to the fields to use the fields at night and then they had been abducted by a yad of men, dominant caste men, and then raped, uh, killed and then hanged in the village in, in, in which they had lived all their lives as, as a show of strength and power, you know. And, and as you rightly say, it was not the biggest case that, that, that we had read about. But it was the biggest case that had happened in, well, well, in terms of biggest, I very specifically mean uh, in terms of media attention, of course, you know, there is no big or small uh, in terms of a brutal crime. Uh, but in terms of media attention, it had got the most attention since the 2012 Delhi bus rape in, in which that young physiotherapy student had boarded a bus thinking this is a public bus and 
um, and then, you know, thereafter died a few days later because of what had happened to her. So I had been uh, thinking about writing a book about sexual violence to process my own experiences, uh, having grown up in Delhi and having felt this, this fear I still can't shake off, by the way, you know, it's been decades, I live on a different continent and I carry that, those feelings with me still. I wanted to process those feelings, I wanted to process my response to um, the, the death of the young physiotherapy student. I wanted to understand who was committing these crimes, why we couldn't stop them, why we were rightfully using words like epidemic. And then this picture of the children showed up on Twitter. And of course, you know, there was the added fact that they were kids. You know, they were just kids who had been going, well, as, as, as one does, going about their lives. And um, then this had happened to them. And I think there's, you know, there, there's this fear as reporters when we when we are particularly moved by something that 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 it should not be reduced to a statistic, you know, as as these things are, and I, in in whatever small way I can, I tend I, I try to write about things that I really would like to preserve in national memory in whatever possible way, and so I thought this could be the case that I would write about. Uh, for all of these reasons, I decided that. Uh, I would uh, go to Katra. I was living in London by then. I would go to Katra and I would talk to their family members. And I thought, well, this is a week's work. And, you know, it was a case of famous last words because yeah. it was not like that at all. So, so you went to Katra first in 2015, I believe. Yeah. Um, and I've heard you say in other interviews sort of your... The, the process, I mean, you would sort of fly from London to Delhi, land in Delhi, take a car right from the airport straight into Uttar Pradesh, a six hour drive, and you would stay there and do your reporting. So give us a sense of what the next few years were like after your first trip, um, you know, what it took to get people to trust you and to open up to you and to tell you not the potted, small, concise story that they've told the media before, but the more expansive story filled with the kind of details and ambiguities that uh, that are in the book. And in particular, I'm interested in what it was like uh, as a woman reporter to go out there and talk to men and to talk to women, uh, because obviously this entire book is about the dynamics between the sexes in a place like Katra. And so you've introduced another dynamic, which is uh, also related to uh, uh, to men and women, but you are an outsider, uh, a woman who's coming from the outside and talking to this. So what did it take to unpack all of this detail? So think about uh, the situation that I arrive in, right? It's just been a year since uh, the children have died. And uh, it, it, it was, in fact, the first death anniversary. And their parents are processing an immense trauma. Uh, you know, it's a kind of trauma for uh, which you can't even talk to somebody about. The loss of a child, I think, is, is one of those things. You, you can't even ask somebody. Uh, it, it's sort of, you know, the pain is, is so immense, I, I can only imagine. And so you are meeting people who are severely traumatized. That is number one. Number two, you're meeting people who have not been allowed to process their trauma. You know, uh, any of us who have lost somebody we love, we of course, uh, you know, respond in different ways. But I can imagine that, uh, you know, uh, I would retreat. I would just want to be by myself in a dark place for as long as I possibly could. Um, I don't want to talk to people, I wouldn't want to. Uh, they have never been allowed to process their trauma in private because in addition to suffering loss, then they had to take on the burden of, 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 of fighting and demanding justice. Uh, so, you know, they, they actually had a job to do, the most important job that a parent in that situation can find themselves doing, justice for the children that they lost. So that means that they have been talking to media persons 
uh, you know, documentary filmmakers, reporters from the US, reporters from the UK, their own local reporters with whom they have a good rapport. And what, what that does, and Samanth, you will know this very well, is that you, they are asked the same questions. So they get used to giving a certain set of answers. Uh, it's, and, and let's say they have, uh, you know, by mistake made uh, an error in the initial telling of a story that becomes crystallized. So one year has passed, not only are they telling that same story over and over again, but those errors become part of the narrative and they are published uh, as, as, as truth, right? So that's the second thing, thing that happens. Uh, that is the environment that I am going into. The third thing that is, uh, again, particular to this case was that the family, uh, as I said, uh, understandably wanted justice. It just so happened that in their pursuit of justice, they said and did things that, uh, you know, one can, I think, fairly argue were unjust to other people, you know. So while being in empathetic towards their cause and completely understanding why they, why they made those decisions, I still had to talk to them about it. And it's not uh, an easy thing to do, not just because of the, a personal level of discomfort, right? But because um, no one, none of us likes to admit that we have uh, told a falsehood. Uh, and especially if that means that things start to unravel, you know? So it's all of those things that I had to, uh, I, I found myself in, in the midst of. Um, the family was very kind, uh, very gracious to me. You know, they did not under any circumstances have to give me time. There's nothing in it for them. One year later, what am I going to do for you? You know, really. Uh, and somebody like me who is going to keep showing up over and over and asking the same questions is really more of a burden. But they, they responded to me in, 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 with, with great graciousness. Uh, the challenge that I think that all of us face in situations like this is that, you know, um, is to how to get people to stop saying what they've been saying kind of on rote and to say, okay, uh, don't tell me this, this version. Can you just, just like, can we just have a conversation? You know, um, tell me what you saw, what you heard, um, who you were with, what you were eating. Just, can we just have a conversation like just, Casually. That, like regular people. Yeah. Regular people, right? But that took a year. And that to me seems perfectly standard. It does take a year in, in that. And, and uh, by the way, when I say a year, I'm not sitting at, in their house for a year, sure. right? I mean, but just to get to a point where you, you let people say what they want to say to become comfortable um, and to feel like they've said their piece, which is very important. And at the same time, uh, to, to encourage them to talk to you in a way that allows sort of like a, a, a free conversation. In this case, because of the constraints that the family was under, that free conversation was never possible. So when you say to me, you know, how did you win their trust? I don't believe that I did. Uh, I don't know that you can win the trust of somebody in such circumstances. And, and neither should it be an aspiration, I, I believe. And frankly, why I applaud them for not trusting me. Uh, why would you trust a journalist? Someone shows up at your house, you know, says, I'm from London, I interested, I'm interested in your case. Why would you talk to them freely? Rather than you giving them information, let that journalist do the work. They mm -hmm. want to know what happened, find out. You know, there are a thousand families in the village, do the work. And that is how it happened. So there were no, there was no exchange of confidences. You know, I don't believe that Sohan Lal, who is uh, Lali's father or Jeevan Lal, Padma's father, at any point thought, let me tell her something I have not told a hundred people before. I did have very good conversations with, with wives, with their wives, with their children, with cousins, with uncles. But that is a standard of journalism that when one person does not talk to you, you simply talk to people around them. 
and you build your story. And with that information, then you can go back to somebody and say, look, this is what I've been told by your closest relative, by your son. I can say to Sohanlal, your son told me this. Would you like to respond? I can say to Jeevan Lal, your, 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 your wife, your first wife's uncles, uh, brothers, had this to say, and I would love to know what, what you have to say. When you show the effort, uh, perhaps not even when you show the effort, when you show the information, then people say, okay, you know, I, I will respond. And that is really what happened. This story is not so much about me talking to one person, it's me talking to, ar around lots and lots and lots of people, building all those circles around Katra village going all the way uh, across Uttar Pradesh. And, you know, finally, to the point of what it's like being a woman and reporting, uh, you know, years ago when I was in reporting in Vidarbha, I was at a, uh, at a rally of uh, farmers and uh, I was with a journalist and for some reason he had brought his wife and the wife during the rally leaned towards me and she said, you realize that you, if it wasn't for me, you would be the only woman here. And I hadn't actually realized that. Mm -hmm. And when I lifted my head uh, and I looked around, there were thousands of people and they were all men. And of course, it's a tremendous crush of people because it's a rally. And that sense of it's just me, um, it was very unsettling for me. And it really threw me off my game for the rest of the day. You know, I lost a, the rest of the day because I thought of that and what, the, you know, where, what might happen. I can't afford to lose my days with these sort of things. I mean, I understand that they are, they can be, you, you know, they're real issues that I need to think about. And in whatever way I can, I do make sure that I look after myself, but I can't let those thoughts occupy me. Um, and I, in my in my experience, you know, uh, again, it's it's about showing that you do your job. Um, if I go with to people with information and I come back over and over, people respond, and you know, maybe they're like, "Okay, you're a really strange lady. You keep showing up here and and asking questions, and that's weird." But maybe not. But the fact is that they talk to me, and and ultimately, I'm not interested in anyone's opinion of me i'm only interested in 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 the work right right um i'm going to uh, deprive our listeners of the pleasure of reading having sonia read a second excerpt because we have not much time left now so many questions but, I, but the most uh, singular part of your book i think and this is something that uh, this book shares with 13 men with your previous book which is also about uh, sexual assault uh, is your uh, restraint in not blaming any one part of your society or the political establishment or the, um, the, the you know the police or any any part of this uh, environment that persists in places like Katra to not blame uh, one of them and to instead sort of indicate uh, not necessarily with uh, quite directly but implicitly a kind of systemic breakdown. Mm -hmm. um, a, a fact that there is some kind of systemic uh, dysfunction that uh, permeates all of these places to the extent, even as we talked about yesterday, uh, people can do their best and it yeah. is still not good enough to uh, either protect the women or to subsequently investigate and find the truth about their deaths. Uh, could you talk a little bit about this and, and the fact that this happened both in 13 Men and in uh, this book, I find quite remarkable and I find it to be uh, indicative of a deeper truth about rural India today. Yeah, you know, when I went to Katra, it was um, with the sense that that everybody who had um, encountered the family of Padman Lali on the night the children had disappeared. So, you know, from the five policemen who work at the Chalky, which is just a five minute walk from uh, the Shakya house to later on the next day, the, the politicians, 
the police officers, the state level police officers, then of course, you know, there's the, the post-mortem doctors and so on and so forth. The, the crowd around them the, gets larger and larger. More and more people are working on the case. More and more people are invested in it and are answerable. So the sense that I was given was that everybody had somehow out of a sense of malice, uh, perhaps motivated by the, the cast of the shakas, motivated by the cast of uh, the Yadavs, because of course at the time Akhilesh Yadav was in power, perhaps just out of disdain for the poor, had uh, stopped themselves from doing their job, you know, had done just that little bit less as though to, to show the family their place. And, you know, I have no doubt that this does happen. This is simply a, a too familiar theme for us to not, um, for us to not be, make, uh, believe it. But in this particular case, what I found was that perhaps something worse, Samanth, which is that everybody did exactly what they knew. There were exceptions. There was one or two exceptions. For example, one of the five police officers at the Chalky that night went out of his way to subvert the search for the missing children. But the other four did exactly what they have done with what they have, would have done for anybody else. This is all they know. This is the best they can do. You know, in, in later on the next day when the children are, are being examined in the post-mortem house by Lala Ram with his, you know, bazaar bought butcher knives. Lala Ram, who I've met many times, a, a wonderful guy who has been trained as much as many anybody else in his line of work, which is 15 days and has been doing this for 20 years in the same way, you know, just dealing with bodies in, in, in that way. So they did what they knew, but what people know, what they are equipped to do is not sufficient to allow, uh, you know, allow justice to take its course, to give investigators and ultimately the courts the information they need to make uh, a, a, an informed decision. And so ultimately what, you, what happens is that terrible things take place and nobody knows, it's all guesswork. And the family is, is left not just with this, you know, gaping hole in their lives, this great loss, but also a sense of, but what happened? How did it happen? I mean, we all know what happens, right? That's often the one thing that we do know, but how did it happen is, is a much more delicate question. What were the circumstances that enabled this? And because, nothing works quite as it should. Everything is slightly off the hinges. You know, in India, you don't, you're left with this, left with this, this sense of absolute, a greater loss, you know, two losses, basically. Right. I mean, I relate this quite, you said in the past um, that a journalist shouldn't have an opinion when you're writing um, a book of this kind. You said it with, uh, you know, in 13 Men, for example, you said it wasn't your job necessarily to come to a conclusion. Um, it was to provide the reader with enough um, material so that they can make up their own minds about what happened and who was to blame and who isn't to blame. Um, uh, but you are, for all intents and purposes right now, outside of Katra Sadat Ganj, you are the best informed person about this case, about this incident and about the people who are there. Um, can I push back on this and ask you, why as a reader, should I not look to you for an opinion? I want the best informed opinion there is, and you are the best informed person about this case and this incident uh, that there is right now. And so why would I not seek an opinion from you and ask you what to think? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good question. <laughs> uh, so I think there are two things, you know, one is in the craft itself and one is just personal opinion. I just, I have very, very strong opinions about things, you know, and I think that I worry about that spilling over into my work for the, for the reason that it will hurt the, the craft, you know, I mean, writing a book, you know, is such a delicate matter. It's all about, you know, it's, it's language, it's construction, it's narrative, it's tempo, you know, it's so many things. And 
when you come in with my level of strong feeling, I worry that I would just mess up the, the, the actual book, you know, just, just from a point of craft. Uh, so that is one reason, is that my, con that's my concern. The other reason is that I, I really strongly believe that, you know, there is a place for opinion and there is a place for fact. And, you know, you want to hear me shout, I'm on Twitter, you know, uh, <laughs> but this, and this is not the place for me. And 13 Men is not, uh, is, was similar. And, and so beautiful thing was, of course, different. I was actually in that book. It's just, it's just what I believe is that people should be allowed to step into a book. You know, the book is your world. You're stepping into it. I have given you everything. Now you decide, because these are questions also that, you know, it comes down to your, 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 your beliefs, like your ideas about justice. Um, what is justice? Is justice only for the grieving? Or is justice for all? I mean, I think that is a central part of this book, you know, terrible things have happened. But those of us who have not committed the crime should not be punished for it. You know, at the same time, terrible things have happened. So you need to balance all of those things. And I think it asks so many questions that that I would like readers to simply think about and process on their own. Right, right. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience. So I'm just going to quickly triage them. Uh, Ashish, I think we should leave Sri Lanka for another session. This is Sonia's book panel. Um, there's a couple of questions uh, that may be related, so I can kind of maybe put them together, uh, which is somebody has asked what made you write about this incident rather than the Delhi incident of 2012. Um, and somebody else has asked, how did you first know about this incident? I mean, I think you mentioned that it was through Twitter, through the image on Twitter uh, of the two girls hanging from the tree. Uh, is, did you consider at all writing about the Delhi, uh, the, uh, the grisly Delhi gang rape as it's come to be known. Um, do you choose one over the other uh, is a question from one of the audience members. I didn't think about writing uh, about the, the, the Delhi bus rape. I think that uh, it, um, I think I needed to, to, to see everything that had happened after the Delhi bus rape, you know, people's protests, the changes in the law, the, the fact that the media was suddenly reporting um, ab about the sexual violence in a way that we had never seen. I think probably all of those things played into my decision to actually write uh, a, a book about sexual violence in India. Right. Um, Sumit asks, the pain in your voice and the agony in your eyes literally shook me. How different was the writing? girls from 13 men um how different was what sorry was the writing process of this book versus 13 men so you know in in 13 men for uh, for those viewers who don't know was uh, was a case that took place uh in in west bengal in, in an indigenous community uh, a woman who was uh, i believe 19 years old at the time accused uh, 13 men of uh, you know setting upon her one night during a, a, a council meeting and and raping her and um, the court, you know, the, the case went to trial very, very quickly. The, in fact, the case was investigated very promptly. It went to trial. The men were convicted of, uh, of, of, of the crimes of which they were accused. And that was different. I was the only reporter who, um, who met that young woman. And she was an adult. And she was able to speak for herself. And therefore, she was able to advocate for herself. That is the most important difference, that here these were children and they were not there to, to be interviewed by me. So I had to, you know, uh, treat them as I would victims of any crime, but also children uh, and also you know, try and get a sense of their lives through the people who they were closest to. And because of their age, Samant, you know, the people that they are closest to uh, at age 14 and 16 are not parents. Um, they are peers, you know, so their cousin Manju, uh, who was 14 at the time and who spent the last week with them, their friends in school and so on and so forth. So that was, it's very different when you write about a 
a person by talking to that individual and then you write about them um in 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 the past tense yeah yeah um there's a very good question that i would love to ask which is uh from one of our listeners shrishti how do you not let your personal rage affect the narrative because clearly these are things that make us angry um i can only imagine how much angrier it makes you as a woman um for these incidents to continue to happen with such impunity how do you not let your personal rage affect the narrative is it possible to be objective or balanced when you sit down to write the book uh and to keep your rage out of it uh you and i both know the answer to this question it's called rewrites it's called it is a phenomenon of the endless draft uh and uh until late uh, into the writing process so now we are in 2021 2020 actually in the autumn of 2020 i had sent uh the book to uh, a a close friend of mine and he said uh you know nice things and then he said there is one chapter in which you sound very angry and uh I said yes because uh, you know naturally and he said just yeah. one <laughs> just one and he said yeah I just want you to know that and it was so um it was such an insightful comment because the whole narrative was you know sort of flat is one way of describing it but you know and then there was this one uh chapter where I couldn't contain myself and again it comes down to you know uh you you're hurting the narrative and you're you're going against what you want to do which is you want people to to make those decisions and and think about those things by themselves so it hurts it hurts the work and in terms of how do i deal with it you know um, who i am as a person and who i am as a writer can dig i can compartmentalize uh i can compartmentalize quite well right um sonia has been very kind in including me uh in her umbrella um uh, def- I, I, you know umbrella definition of writers who redraft and rewrite uh my idea is to change an adjective here and there sonia <laughs> is to do completely drift different drafts uh am i right in saying there are four different drafts of this book alone or five yeah. uh yeah. and they're all it, it would be like reading different books about the same subject is what sonia's drafting process is like uh so um so they, that is how she deals with it she essentially sort of uh makes sure she explores every single nook and cranny of this narrative until she has um it, the book is never clinical i think which is still a testament to your writing ability sonia it is still warm and full of life and full of your empathy for the people who live there um but it is still as dispassionate as a writer could make it which i think is is something that uh, is truly remarkable um we're very close to the end of the session so i just want to thank you sonia for uh for explaining the process behind the good girls i learned a lot and i i really hope uh viewers did as well saman thank you so much for your time it's super early here i'm sure you have many better things to do but thank you for everything thank you Thank you all. Thank you for listening. Thank you. We thank our celebration partner Diageo for their support and we thank all of you for being such a lovely audience. Please do remember to pick up your copy of the book from the Amazon bookstore and if you're interested in some retail therapy, do check out our merchandise partner Earth Fables. We do hope you will continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that we have specially curated for you. As you're aware, the cultural sector has been critically impacted by the pandemic and while we have braced ourselves to embrace the new normal, we too have struggled to ensure that we continue to bring to you a free flow of knowledge and ideas. We would be grateful for your support towards Teamwork Arts. any contribution is welcome please do tweet using hashtag jaipur literature festival 2021 and tag us at jaipur lit fest the festival is protected by detol we hope to see you in our next sessions